Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Welcome to our 10 a.m. education program. My name is Rachel, and today we are going to be talking about second grade curriculum relating to differing habitats around the world. Now, this is going to be our third habitat that we are covering in this series, and today we are doing a really unique habitat. We are going to be studying the wetlands ecosystem. Now, wetlands are ecosystems around the world that have water in them at least some of the year. And it's not usually salt water, although there are some salt water wetlands, but it's also fresh water as well. So we're not talking about the oceans. We're talking about places like swamps, marshes, bogs, fens, and many of these pools of water that are there at least part of the year. Now, wetlands cover 6% of the world, but it is home to many unique species of plants and animals. So today, we are gonna talk about some of the plants and animals and their adaptations for living in the wetlands, and we're going to meet a real wetlands animal that lives here in Kansas. So let's get started. First, we wanna talk about a few of the plants in the wetlands. What I have here is a picture of the North American water lily, which is a beautiful white flower that we have here in the United States. Now, many types of plants that live in the wetlands, not only are their roots and their stems um, adapted to being able to take on a lot of water, but so are their leaves. You will notice that around this lily are leaves that are really round and really big. That is because by being so wide, it allows them to take on more sun, and that allows them to do photosynthesis really effectively. So you'll notice that many of the leaves and flowers in the wetlands are really big so they can get more sunlight. Plants like water lilies also have a waxy covering to them, and that allows them to not dry out so that they can live in the water for long periods of time. That waxy coating also helps them to float on the top of the water. So plants that live in the wetlands are pretty well adapted to being wet. Another example of a plant that lives in the wetlands and is very common are cattails. Cattails are found in wetlands all around the United States, and these are oftentimes submerged or underwater for a portion of their life. Interestingly, the roots and the stems and the leaves of these plants actually have open spaces. They have holes in them so that oxygen, so that air can get in, so that even when they are underwater, they are able to survive. So these beautiful cattail plants, they do very well in wetland ecosystems. So do many animals. Animals who live in the wetlands, like the alligator, are oftentimes colored or camouflaged to blend in super well with the murky water. So although we don't have alligators here in Kansas, they do live in wetlands, in swamps and marshes in the southeastern United States. And they thrive in those wet places because they are really good at swimming, with their webbed feet and their long tail, and they are the color of the water. Even when they hatch out of their eggs, they blend in really, really well. So alligators is one of the bigger predators that lives in a wetland. Now here in Kansas, we have lots of differing reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, mammals that live in the wetlands. Let's talk about a few of the reptiles that you might see here in Kansas. One of the most obvious ones are red-eared sliders and different types of turtles. These are water turtles and they love to live in our ponds, our rivers, our lake, and our aquatic wetland areas. Just like the alligator, they've got this dark murky color to them which allows them to camouflage and blend into the water. Now this is a medium-sized turtle because they like to eat things like small fish, frog eggs, some of the plants in the wetlands. But here in Kansas, we also get bigger sized turtles as well. For instance, you might come across one of these guys, a snapping turtle. 
Now snapping turtles are bigger than our red-eared sliders, our pond turtles, and they have a really sharp beak on the front of their mouth that they use for catching and killing their prey. They are carnivores, so they are going to be eating only meat. Things like snakes and fish and frogs in the water. Now snapping turtles are the turtle species that you have to be a little bit careful of here in Kansas. And they're pretty easy to identify once you know what you're looking for. First of all, you can see that mouth, they look really prehistoric. And they oftentimes look a little bit cranky with that big uh, sharp beak and that wide open mouth. But an easier way to tell if it's a snapping turtle is to simply look for the long tail. Snapping turtles have super long tails um, compared to the length of their body. They also have ridges that go along the top of their shell um, that kind of go down their backbone. So if it's got a long tail and ridges on its shell, that is a snapping turtle. Now you will oftentimes see turtles trying to cross the road. And if you ever see one, please break and let them cross. The man in the photo here is actually helping a snapping turtle across the road and he's doing it the correct way. He's grabbing it by the back of its shell. Snapping turtles have really flexible necks where they can move their neck to the side, on top, and on bottom about three quarters of the way back of their body. So by grabbing them by the very back of the shell, the snapping turtle cannot reach the man and he is helping them safely. You can also pick them up by the very base of their tail, right where it meets their shell, and kind of pick them up that way and grab them just a little bit underneath their plastron, which is the bottom part of their shell, and pick them up gently and move them across the road. But if you're uncertain and you don't want to touch it, which is totally fine, maybe just get um, a shovel or a broom and kind of help push it along and stop traffic until it gets across. Because snapping turtles are important as well. Now here in Kansas, we have 38 to 40 differing types of snakes, and all snakes have the ability to swim. Sometimes people think that if a snake is in the water, it is venomous. However, that is not true. All snakes can swim. Here in Kansas, in Shawnee County, and in Douglas County, and in northeastern parts of the uh, state, we have what we call the northern water snake. Now this is a very common type of snake that is in our wetlands. These are not venomous. They cannot hurt you. But oftentimes people mistake this harmless snake for a cottonmouth. Cottonmouths are only found in Cherokee County in Kansas. This is the southeasternmost county in our state. So if you live in Topeka, Lawrence, anywhere in northeast Kansas, you are not going to find cottonmouths. So if you see a brown colored snake like this in our waterways, it cannot hurt you. It is just a water snake. It is not venomous. But just like the alligator and the turtle, it is darkly colored so it blends in really, really well with the water. Water. Now in Kansas we also have a variety of birds that enjoy the wetlands as well. Birds like geese and ducks are very well adapted to the aquatic lifestyle because they have webbed feet. Many animals that live in the wetlands, they're adapted to the water because of this extra skin between their toes. This is what we call webbing or webbed feet and it acts like a paddle. It allows the ducks and the geese and the frogs and the alligators to swim really, really quickly. So ducks and geese love living on the water. They like eating the plants and as well as some of the fish and the bugs that are in the water. So you will oftentimes see many differing varieties of ducks and geese here in Kansas. Oftentimes it's rare, um, but up in the northern states, especially in the wetlands, you'll find birds like trumpeter swans. We actually have two of these swans here at the Topeka Zoo in our collection, and they have successfully had chicks or cygnets, babies over the years, which have been released into the wild. But there have been a few rare sightings in Kansas of this bird as well. And again, just like the ducks and goose, um, the trumpeter swans, they have webbed feet and they love feeding on all of the wetlands plants. So if you ever see a trumpeter swan in Kansas, count yourself super lucky because they love living in the northern states uh, a little bit farther up than we are.
Now, here in Kansas, we also have a variety of invertebrates, or animals without a backbone, that live in our water waterways. Things like crayfish. This is an example of an animal called a northern crayfish, which is really hard for me to say because as a Kansan, we want to call these crawdads, and that is completely acceptable. This animal goes by many names. Crayfish, crawfish, crawdads, it's all the same thing. It is this crustacean creature that lives in the bottom of our ponds and um, is an omnivore, which means they are going to be eating the plants, um, the living and the dead ones, as well as differing types of animals. They'll eat fish, they'll eat frogs, they'll even eat other crayfish or crawdads. So at the bottom of our wetlands, you can find this animal. We have other types of invertebrates in Kansas as well. Things like insects that live near the water. For instance, you might, if you're near a pond, see animals like dragonflies and damselflies. Both of these are carnivorous. They eat other animals, types of insects, and they're very similar. However, dragonflies, you can tell the difference because they hold their wings open and down, like this one, the common green darner. And damselflies, like this American ruby spot, they hold their wings together and upright. So if the wings are out like this, it's a dragonfly. If the wings are back like this, it is a damselfly. And we have both here in Kansas. Dragonflies also tend to be a little bit bigger than damselflies, and sometimes dragonflies will eat the damselflies. But both of them are going to be eating other types of insects like flies and mosquitoes. Speaking of mosquitoes, we can't talk about the wetlands without talking about that pesky insect. Mosquitoes love living near water. And the reason that is, is because mosquitoes actually lay their eggs in water. Most mosquito species need some sort of water for their eggs to be able to hatch out. And then those eggs actually go through metamorphosis, which means they change the way they look. That is their life cycle. So they go from eggs to larva, to pupa, and then to an adult mosquito. Now mosquitoes, oftentimes, especially the males, they drink nectar from flowers around the wetlands, but the females, in order to have enough energy and protein to create eggs, the females actually need blood, which is why mosquitoes love to bite humans. Actually, the saliva of mosquitoes is what allows um, us to not feel it when a mosquito is biting us. It not only makes the blood thinner so that they can drink it easier, but the saliva of a mosquito numbs our skin so we oftentimes don't feel them there for several seconds. So you can see lots of insects in the wetlands as well. Now you guys, today for the live animal that we are going to meet, this is the Kansas State Amphibian. If any of you guys know what the state amphibian is, please put it in the comments because lots of amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, newts, obviously love living in the wetlands because the word amphibian itself means to lead a double life. That means they are born in the water, they change their life cycle and are able to move on to land as an adult. But this animal is one that we have here in Kansas. They live in the wetlands. They are nocturnal and they oftentimes burrow underneath the ground as well. If you guessed barred tiger salamander as the state amphibian, you are right. This handsome guy here is Hulk and he is a barred tiger salamander. Bar tiger salamanders are our Kansas state amphibian. And interestingly, they come in two separate colors. They come in this green color, which Hulk gets his name from, and they also come in a vibrant yellow color, kind of like this toy that I have right here. But both are the same species. They are the barred tiger salamander. Now, just like our alligator and our turtle and our snake, these animals are darker in color so that they are able to camouflage in with the dirt in the water where they live. They also have the yellow and green color as a warning. Does anybody know what a tiger salamander is warning of with these beautiful colors? 
I'll give you a hint. It's the same warning that a poison dart frog or a monarch butterfly or a ladybug has by being bright colors. All of those are warning colors signaling that this is a poisonous animal. Now, picking up Hulk, it's not going to do you any harm unless he has actually secreted that poison. Underneath the base of his tail, right around here, is there is a gland, and that is where the poison comes out. And he can choose to secrete, to have that poison come out or not. So his whole body is not caked in poison. It simply comes out of this gland if he chooses to do so. But he can have that poison come out if a predator is trying to eat him. Because if a predator eats a poisonous salamander and gets really, really sick, they are never going to try and eat one of these guys again. Now, bar tiger salamanders, they are carnivores, so they eat other animals. He loves eating fish eggs and earthworms and slugs and uh, small animals that are in the mud. Now, they do go through a life cycle change, metamorphosis. Um, here is a picture of their life cycle. So, one female bar tiger salamander can lay up to 100 eggs at a time, and she lays them in the water, and after they hatch out of their egg, they become their larva stage, where they actually have gills that they breathe through. And then as they grow older, they start to grow their limbs. Salamanders grow their front legs first, which I think is interesting because frogs grow their back legs first, and then they grow their back legs, and then they start to lose their gills and become an adult salamander. So the life cycle, the change in the way they look from the egg stage to an adult, depends on the salamander species, how long it takes. It could take just a few days for some species to up to several years. And there are over 600 species of salamanders that we know of worldwide. So there is a lot of diversity in this animal group. But if you see one of these animals in the wetlands here in Kansas, count yourself lucky because they do live pretty secretive lives. They can burrow pretty deep underground and they come out at nighttime. So this is not an animal that you see very often. And sometimes if you're looking for salamanders, you have to overturn logs or kind of dig in the mud as a way to find them. So before we take questions, I do want to show you guys our homework assignment for our second graders today. This is a wetland word scramble. And what you all need to do is unscramble the words at the side as um, it's a plant or animal that lives in the wetlands. And once you've unscrambled each one of these, the green circles right here lead you to a secret message at the bottom. So I want you to unscramble the plants and animals we learned about, decode the secret message, and take a picture and put it in the comments. So my friends, today we learned all about wetlands. Wetlands cover 6% of the Earth's surface. However, over the last 100 years, wetlands, we have lost 50% of them. Half of the wetlands in the world are gone. And that is because of habitat loss. We're destroying the wetlands and making our own houses and beach houses and shopping centers and pollution. So these animals that live in the water, they are sensitive. Amphibians, like salamanders and frogs, they actually breathe through their skin. That is why I have Hulk in the water here, so he stays wet, because that is one of his defenses. But if there's a lot of pollution in his waterway, it is going to harm him. So we need to do what we can to protect the wetlands. They are one of the most rapidly degrading ecosystems in the world, which means we are losing them at a very alarming rate. So next time you're near a bog or a fen, a swamp, a marsh, a pond, take a look around. Appreciate the plant and animal life and know that that is rare and we need to protect it. So that is the end of our class I will take any questions that we have on wetland plants, wetland animals, or Hulk, our beautiful barred tiger salamander. Uh, can you tell us again what salamanders eat? Salamanders are carnivores, so they eat meat. And in the wild, he is going to be eating like a lot of the 
like the slugs and the earthworms and the snails that are in the mud. He might also eat fish eggs or super small fish as well. But he's going to be eating the smaller animals in the wetlands. Hi, Eli. <laughs> okay, going through some of the questions here. All righty. I thought it was a newt. Um, yeah, so salamanders and newts are very closely related. Newts are actually types of salamanders. Um, so that is a close guess. Eva says salamander. A lot of you guys knew salamanders were the state amphibian. I love that. Good morning, Mrs. Meyer, second grade class from Shawnee Heights Elementary. It's good to see you guys. Oh, we miss you guys too. We love doing these education programs. Um, we miss our students, but it's a good way to connect to the community and ask questions as well. Eli, what is the biggest amphibian? Um, I'd have to double check, but off the top of my head, I think it's the giant um, salamanders that live over in China. Those guys, I believe, can get up to like six feet long. Um, which they're absolutely gigantic. The National Zoo in Washington, D.C. has some in their collection, and they're very, very cool. Um, that is my guess, Eli. I will double-check that. Uh, do we have a girl salamander? Um, oh, I just looked it up. Yes, it is the Chinese giant salamander. I am correct. Um, and look up some pictures of those, Eli's. They're gigantic, and they're so cool. Um, we do not have a girl salamander. So the Topeka Zoo, we only breed animals that are threatened or endangered. And although amphibians in general are not doing well in the wild, barred tiger salamanders specifically are doing okay. We also don't have enough space to rear up to 100 babies. So we just have Hulk. He was actually a rescue salamander. He came in, um, he, got, he got transferred from Prairie Park Nature Center actually, but somebody had found him in the wild in injured and uh, they took him in and saved him. Double woe. Where could we find a salamander in Kansas? So salamanders are nocturnal and they live at the bottom of ponds, they live in the mud, they live underneath logs. So if you're in a wet area that has a bunch of logs, I would try flipping those over at nighttime, um, but that's kind of a hard thing to do because you're supposed to be sleeping during that time. But that is generally where they live, is wet or moist places, underground or near the ground. Alrighty. Do we have any other questions on amphibians, salamanders, wetlands, anything along those lines? We love Hulk too. He is such a handsome guy. Salamanders are actually super adorable. Uh, their mouths go really far over on their cheeks, so it looks like they're perpetually smiling. So every time I see a salamander, I kind of just want to cuddle it. But don't do that. As you guys will notice, we're not even holding Hulk. He is in a container with water. Amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, because they have that sensitive skin, um, they can they are affected easily if somebody holds them for a long period of time. Um, so you always want to make sure your hands are wet if you pick up a salamander or a frog or a toad, um, just because we want to keep their layer of slime intact. Could you show us what animals are living the, on the pond behind you, or is that too difficult? Yes, in just one second when we end, we will do that for you. Okay, well, you guys are very welcome. Thank you, Eli, Maggie, Nicole. It's always good to hear from you guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for watching. Tomorrow, we will be back at 10 o'clock for a third grade lesson on animal traits. And we can show you the animal that lives in the pond. Um, if you guys want to come over here, we've got to detach from our power source. So our little wetland that we have back here, um, it just actually holds our painted turtle, Mona Lisa, who is hiding under her rock, so you can't actually even see her. We used to have our American alligator in here as well, um, but he got too big, so now he is living in a big pond in the back of the zoo's rainforest, uh, and Mona Lisa has the whole place to herself, which she is very excited about. So we don't have, you can't see her, she's hiding, but this is where she lives. Alrighty, well you guys, thank you so much. We will see you tomorrow for our next class at 10 a.m. Have a good day.